language of our Constitution. It is emphatically the province and duty of the teacher to say what the law is, not what it should be. The John Templeton Foundation has generously partnered with the Federal Society to support the debate today. The Templeton Debate Series on Freedom touched on many important issues in contemporary legal discourse. I am very delighted to introduce Mr. Leroy Murdoch and Professor Andrew Koppelman to the law school community. Your commentator, Devoy Mardog, is a syndicated columnist with Script Hard News Service and a senior fellow with the Atlas Economic Research Foundation. Mr. Mardog's column, The Opinion Just In, reaches about 400 newspapers across America each week, including the New York Post, the Washington Times, the Boston Herald, and the San Francisco Examiner. He is a frequent guest on CNBC, CNN, C-SPAN, Fox News Channel, MSNBC, and other TV and radio outlets. As a popular public speaker, he has lectured or debated at Boston College, the Cato Institute, the Council on Foreign Relations, Harvard Medical School, the Heritage Foundation, the National Academy of Sciences, Dartmouth, Stanford, and Tulane University, as well as in various fora, from Bogota to Buenos Aires to Budapest. He is a native of Los Angeles, a graduate of Georgetown University, and a resident of New York City, where he earned an MBA from the New York University. I'm also very grateful for Professor Andrew Koppelman to propose his opposition. Professor Koppelman is John Paul Stevens Professor of Law at Northwestern. He joined the law school faculty in fall 1997 and is an expert in constitutional law and political philosophy. His current research focuses on paternalism, perfectionism in the law, with special attention to the enforcement of morals. He holds AB from the University of Chicago, Master's, JD, and PhD from Yale University. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer, for that kind introduction. And thank you to you and uh, to Jeff Heatstra and the other members of the Federal Society of Western Law having me here. Uh, this is not my first time in Chicago, but I think it's the first time in about six or seven years, so it's great to be back. Um, enjoyed seeing the Cubs win six to three on Saturday. That was a great time. And uh, also I had an opportunity to see a movie you might enjoy called Lincoln, The Lincoln Lawyer with Matthew McConaughey. You might see that already as um, just a fledgling uh, lawyers in the making. You might find that interesting. He's very, very unconventional. I think the criminal procedure uh, professors might not approve of everything he does, but certainly his court romantics and so on are interesting and it's certainly fun to watch on television. I uh, also want to thank Professor Palpman for being here today. I looked in a little bit into his background and realized that he is ranked number 12 among uh, 50 most cited faculty who have entered teaching since 1992, his actual publication. So the number 12 most uh, cited member of America's faculty. So I'm sure if nothing else, he'll say, he'll say very memorable things to them. <laughs> 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 And thank you to all of you students for being here. I realize you've got uh, papers to write, perhaps a little bit of reading to do. Some of you are looking for positions after you graduate. Uh, you may have uh, roommates to babysit and all that. Here you are today talking about public policy, so I want to thank you for taking the time to do that. And congratulate you uh, for being among the few, the proud, those who give a damn. <laughs> My remarks today are titled The Obama Administration versus Free Enterprise. But before we turn to the current occupant of the White House, let's look back at one of the finest presidents America has been fortunate enough to serve our country. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan said many wise things. I think one of the wisest, wisest he said was the following, and I quote, Today, if you invent a better mousetrap, the government comes along with a better mouse. Reagan, as usual, got it exactly right. As Reagan and his team understood, if you innovate, open a business and hire people, those are good things. We want to encourage that good that sort of behavior, that's good behavior, we want to see more of that. The last government, a lively, jumps in the way. Now, the folks in charge of America today, today are not like uh, the uh, Reagan cabinet here from 1981, but a different group of people. So here we have <laughs> Team Obama. <Lamont. laughs> <laughs> Having a great time on Air Force One, I believe. Uh, here, of course, you have the, the man of the trillion dollar smile, Barack Obama of Chicago, local boy does good. Uh, he's a former community organizer, a graduate of uh, law school. After his successful uh, community organizing efforts in the south side of this city, he went on to the state senate, uh, went on to the United States Senate. Of course, he's president of the United States at the moment. 
Uh, one thing lacking from his resume is any business in management, any, any, any experience in business, any record of actually running any kind of an organization. Uh, not in this photo, but uh, very close at hand is Vice President Joe Biden. Joe Biden was elected to the United States Senate at age 29. He's not much older than those of you in this room. And according to the United States Constitution, you've got to be 30 years old to serve in the U.S. Senate. Luckily for Joe Biden, between election day when he was 29 and when he was sworn in, he actually had a birthday, and so therefore it was legal for him and constitutional for him to be a member of the U.S. Senate. Uh, he served there from age 30 onward, and then his next job was Vice President of the United States. Again, no experience running any organization, running a business, any experience in management or anything of the sort. Um, President Obama is surrounded by a whole lot of political operatives and so on, and a lot of far left activists, including a man by the name of Van Jones, who subsequently has resigned, but he was the White House uh, Green, uh, Green Job Czar, and according to his words, not mine, he's self, uh, self uh, described communist, serving in the White House. He's not, no longer there after getting into a bunch of controversies. Um, what you find among these people is a distinct lack of business experience, any sense of managing a budget, meeting a payroll, coming up with products, marketing them, uh, dealing with, uh, with the finances, and that sort of thing. And in fact, Forbes took a look at this uh, particular phenomenon. And they took a look at the cabinet appointments of presidents from Teddy Roosevelt onward. And generally what you see is that Republican presidents tend to have cabinets with about 50 to 60 percent of the cabinet members with previous, previous experience in business. Democrats run about 30 to 40 percent or so. And over here you've got Barack Obama with a cabinet with about 8 percent of whose members actually have any experience in business management. This led to uh, the uh, Economist in this wonderful cover which describes the situation. While it may have tempered itself a bit since last November's election, uh, as, the economy, as the Economist accurately observed, Team Obama repeatedly has proven hostile to business in many, many ways. Now just meditate for a moment on these amazing comments from Kenneth Feinberg, who's the White House pays on. Kenneth Feinberg was on Fox News Channel in February of last year, and Neil Cavuto asked him a question. Do you ever have a figure in your mind of what connotes, what connotes excessive compensation? Is it a million dollars? Is it two million dollars? And Kenneth we uh, Feinberg, the White House pays are, said, today should, I'm sorry, nobody should receive more than a base cash salary of $500,000 maximum. Now, there may be exceptions in certain cases, but that is sort of the figure that is the benchmark, unquote. I, mean, I find absolutely astonishing that someone like Kenneth Feinberg, who works for us as a government public servant and works for the American people, uh, has any idea in his mind what a CEO should be paid and that, she have, that he ought to have an opinion on this. The man in his position of power should be thinking such things. Now, unfortunately, you find the same kind of command and control attitude rampant among top Democrats in Washington, D.C. In fact, if you take Barack Obama, Joe Biden, Harry Reid, and Nancy Pelosi, they collectively constitute the four horse persons of the apocalypse. <laughs> their solution is ever expanding government, all the time, everywhere. This seems to be their fallback position almost every opportunity when some issue comes up. And again, you see this interesting uh, battle between uh, Obama and Wall Street. They used to be great friends, and now uh, Obama's saying in great, and uh, somebody from, uh, from Wall Street says, uh, traitor back and forth it goes. And then you've got the economist here again with this wonderful illustration. Got big, 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 getting bigger. In many ways, these folks are inflicting huge damage to America's free enterprise system and attempting plenty more. You see that in terms of taxes, health care reform, cap and trade regulations against uh, so-called global warming, federal spending and uh, debt, and an overall reduction in economic freedom. You see it across these areas and others. Let's focus on them one at a time. First of all, as far as taxpayers go, here's the American taxpayer, and it's April 4th, you have 11 days to get your taxes in, you may feel a bit like this, uh, this taxpayer is <coughs> shaken upside down by Uncle Sam. Last year began with 73 tax increases. Congress did not, did not renew, the Democratic Congress did not renew many temporary tax cuts. Among the casualties were a $50 billion, a five, sorry, $5.1 million partial expensing uh, for business asset purchases. Uh, research and experimentation tax credit, $7 billion, that went up in the air. Uh, there's a patch of $63 billion to keep Americans from being exposed to the alternative minimum tax. 70 more, 70, 70 more tax increases on top of that. Grand total between $100 billion and $150 billion. Last year ended, ended with the Republican Party's massive uh, shellacking of the Democratic Party, the word shellacking being Barack Obama's words to describe this. And with the GOP winning the U.S. House of Representatives, increasing its numbers 
in the Senate, winning governorships and state houses coast to coast. Uh, I believe that President Obama showed some sense of reality and agreed to renew many of the 2001 and 2003 uh, tax cuts right around Christmas time um, during, during the uh, so-called lame duck session of Congress. That was a good thing. I'm very glad he did it. I'm glad Congress passed those extensions and signed them. But I think this was much more uh, respond, a matter of him responding to political reality than it was any kind of free market epiphany that he suddenly had. Uh, you look at the corporate tax, for example. America still has the developed world's highest corporate tax at 35%. Uh, Japan, I think, just cut theirs a little bit. They're a little bit below ours. But uh, our, our corporate tax has stayed up at 35%, while the OECD average has dropped down to 24.2%. Every time this goes down, they become more competitive. We stay less competitive. And President Obama says November, once or twice, twice has mentioned the idea of cutting this tax, although we're still awaiting any sort of specifics. Meanwhile, the corporate tax continues to hammer America's international competitiveness and has scared away such big companies as Accenture, Ingersoll Rand, and Tyco International. They've taken their domiciles from the United States to more tax-friendly climates like Switzerland and Ireland. And we actually have companies packing up and getting the hell out of the United States of America because they're sick of paying 35% corporate tax and other, their money's treated much better overseas. Now let's talk a bit about healthcare reform. Well, Obamacare is the law of the land. And while it was being debated, you see here John McCain and Mitch McConnell as the bill was uh, uh, going through the uh, House and Senate. And this legislation, as you can see here, drones on for 2,801 pages. 2,801 page piece of legislation. Now I checked, and that literally is more than double the length of, of the vintage classics edition of Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace. But rather than the Russian tragedy, we have something far more grave, which is dense, baffling legalese. Well, I do, re do realize that criticizing dense, ba baffling legalese at law school is a little bit like standing in the streets of Paris and complaining that the street signs are in French. But I challenge you to a French philosopher to try to make heads or tails of this. This is actually from the uh, Obamacare bill, and this is uh, payments to skilled nursing facilities. And I quote, two, adjustment and recalibration factor, Based on the initial analysis under paragraph one, the secretary shall adjust the case mix indexes under section 1888E4GI of the Social Security Act, 42 U.S. Code 139YYE4GI for fiscal year 2010 by the appropriate recalibration factor as proposed in the rule, proposed rule for Medicare skilled nursing facilities by such secretary on May 20, <coughs> 2009, 74 Federal Register 2214 at unquote. Anybody have any idea what that means? Nobody has any idea what that means. It's totally baffling. Uh, you ask these questions, you get all these interpretations of people trying to figure out what all these, these things mean, and it just creates a great opportunity for regulators to try to figure out exactly what is going on. Now, the Joint Economic Committee of Congress tried to put together a chart to show how all the different parts of Obamacare fit together or don't, and they came up with this wonderful chart. And this literally is a schematic to show how uh, all the different bits and pieces of, of, of Obamacare hold together. Now what's amazing about this is uh, you see all these little dots and so it's, it's a little hard to see up close, but if you see this one, for example, you see the 17 here? That represents 17 uh, particular uh, mandates. And you'll see elsewhere, it'll point to 19 up there, I can't even read it from here, 19 other types of projects. So rather than have 19 different uh, uh, triangles or circles, those are all condensed into 19 of those. These rather than 17 items are condensed into one. So I was told that if you took this entire chart and spread it out and delineated each and every one of those, this would be three times larger. So you're really looking at about one third of Obamacare right here. Obamacare features 302 agencies, boards, commissions, panels, programs, and projects, most of them brand new. Now this new law is horrible in many ways, including for business. We're talking about a $2.5 trillion price tag in its first 10 years of operation and the spending will continue after that remains on the books. There are fines for companies that don't cover their employees or do so inadequately and not up to the satisfaction of the Health and Human Services Department. For example, let's say you have a company, we have about 50 people here, say, let's say you have a company, I'm your boss, and I decide to give you health insurance, and 49 of you are not eligible for uh, subsidies under Obamacare, but one of you is subject to subsidies under, uh, or eligible for subsidies under Obamacare. There is a $2,000 fine applicable 
The fine does not apply to the one of you who is eligible for Obamacare subsidies. The fine uh, would apply to all of you in the room. And so I, as employer, rather than writing a check for $2,000, or would write a check for $100,000, covering each and every one of you, even though only one of you is eligible for subsidies under Obamacare. That is grossly unfair and bizarre and twisted and not good at all for American business. Look at the medical device industry. According to the Industry Association Advocate, 70% of medical device manufacturers have fewer than 100 employees and make less than $100 million. $100 million. So these are not enormous multi-billion dollar corporations. These innovative companies make such products as heart stents, such as the one Bill Clinton had put in his chest last year. Uh, they make artificial uh, prosthetic limbs for people who come back from Afghanistan and Iraq and have lost arms and legs. They help them walk again and have some uh, fake arms. Insulin pumps for diabetics. This is the kind of stuff that these people make life-saving, uh, life-giving, life-enhancing equipment. But what is the thanks they get for doing that? A brand new tax under Obamacare. <coughs> $20 billion over 10 years. $2 billion per year approximately, and that works out to about $5,500 per employee in that industry. That's a significant sum of money. Uh, it's one we call the pacemaker tax, which is my name for it. And the pacemaker tax is one-fifth of the industry's research and development budget and it's equal to over half of the venture capital raised by that industry in 2007. So this is a significant amount of money that's being pulled right out of the pockets of the medical device industry. What does that do for medical device innovation? Nothing good at all. And if you take a look at these companies, uh, Obamacare was passed or signed March 23, 2010, just over a year ago. And by April 2, 2010, a, little, a couple days uh, past a year ago, these companies announced that they would be suffering, took charges against future earnings because of Obamacare, a billion dollars by AT&T, 970 million by Verizon, 150 million by John Deere Company. These companies alone took $2.8 billion in charges against future earnings based just upon the impact that Obamacare would have on them at that point, and probably more down the road. This is money that they've taken off the books that they otherwise could use to hire people, come up with new products, come up with uh, ex uh, export expansion plans, new factories, new equipment, instead mm -hmm. charging losses against, uh, charging their uh, losses against revenues because of the costs of Obamacare already. And look at the financial charges that America's largest corporations have taken already. <coughs> the tax deduction uh, that they would have gotten for providing drug benefits to the retirees will, will become non-deductible under Obamacare, and that's part of what's contributed to this mess. This is a picture that I snapped last night in front of a cigar bar. <coughs> Actually, this leads to our, our next issue, which is cap and trade. The cap and trade bill didn't fool Congressman John Dingell, the veteran liberal Democrat from Michigan. He said, quote, nobody in this country realizes that cap and trade is a tax and a great big one. This was a bill passed by the Democratic House in, I think, 2009. It did not pass the Senate. It was <coughs> representative of something that President Obama wanted and that House Democrats loved. Uh, how big a tax, according to John Dingell, uh, between now and 2019, $846 billion. $846 billion with a B in brand new taxes. All to fight carbon dioxide, which I'm emitting right now. Nonetheless, in 2009, the EPA, under President Obama, designated CO2 as a pollutant, quote unquote. The Obama administration will use this ruling to engage in endless regulatory mischief much of which will burden or break small and medium-sized companies, and likely big ones too. And consider the comments that Senator Barack Obama made about the cap and trade concept. While he was senator, this San Francisco Chronicle interview, January 17, 2008, he said the following, under my plan of a cap and trade system, electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket. Coal power plants, you know, natural gas, you name it, whatever the plants were, whatever the industry was, they would have to retrofit their operations. That will cost money, they will pass that money on to consumers, unquote. Not good for business, not good for consumers, according to President, uh, then Senator Barack Obama, uh, January 2008. And in that interview, he continued. So if somebody wants to build a coal plant, they can. It's just that it will bankrupt them because they're going to be charged a huge sum for all that greenhouse gas that's being emitted, unquote. So here we have the man who wanted to be President of the United States, the man who is President of the United States, bragging that his cap and take trade plan will bankrupt American companies. Again, not good for the business. Here we have Secretary, uh, Energy Secretary Stephen Chu, 
and he said, somehow we have to figure out how to boost the price of gasoline to the levels in Europe. A uh, gallon of gas in Europe, we're complaining because we're approaching $4. A gallon of gas in Europe is probably five, six bucks or, or more, depending on what the uh, exchange rate is with the euro at any given time. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a lot of money, and if you were running a trucking company, a delivery service, or if you have a taxi cab company, or just your own personal taxi, having the price of gas in America rise to the level you see in Europe, which is the desired policy of the U.S. Energy Secretary, is not good for your business. Very bad for you, your employees, your stockholders, and your uh, customers and, uh, and clients. Now, there's one thing. There's one thing that Team Obama does well with gusto. It's spending money. Unfortunately, they simply have accelerated the massive and unforgivable expenditures of the G.W. Bush Road administration. The Cato Institute uh, scholar Chris Edwards took a look at spending from Eisenhower forward. And he found that uh, George W. Bush was the biggest spender since Lyndon Baines Johnson. G.W. Bush hiked the federal budget 83% in nominal terms over eight years. And Reaganites like me were disgusted by that, we complained about it, we criticized it, we shamed him. It was an awful thing, and, and it was a disgusting pattern of behavior, which has made it possible for Obama to do much that he has done. And uh, there was no need for Bush to have done this. He took off on a massive tariff spending, and this country sadly is paying the price for that and again, egged on by Karl Rove at every, at every turn. Unfortunately, this, re this reflects decades of reckless spending, as you can see here. The spending has continued for a long, long time. This is a baseline from 1970. You can see median household income between 1970 and 2008 has gone up 29%. Adjusted for inflation, it's all inflation adjusted real dollars. 1970 until 19 2008, federal spending up 242%. So yes, this is Obama's problem. Yes, this is Jimmy Bush's problem. He's a problem that's gone on for a long, long time, unfortunately. But what's sad is that President Obama talked about change. He could have come in and done something about this, and he did. He basically took this curve and had to take off even more rapidly. Huge amounts of spending. For example, consider just a few highlights of, of the Obama administration's spending patterns. President Obama signed a $447 billion omnibus spending bill, spanning 2,442 pages. This include, include over 5,200 pork barrel projects, worth $3.9 billion, including $700,000 for, and I quote, shrimp industry, fishing effort, research continuation in Silver Spring, Maryland. You all pay for that. Even worse, while inflation is just running about 1.5%, uh, uh, this, this bill hiked federal spending by 12%, uh, roughly inflation times 6, inflation times 7. U.S. Treasury announced blank checks for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for the next three years. Estimated cost, perhaps as much as $400 billion for the beat. And if they want more than that, all they need to do is come in and ask, and Treasury will write them a random check for whatever Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac want. Obama's proposed budget spends $3.8 trillion this year, up 8.6% above last year's spending level. Again, well above inflation. This includes a one-year deficit of $1.6 trillion. Over the next 10 years, such de deficits alone total $8.5 trillion, and that's with a T. Speaking of, tr of trillions, consider the deficit projections for the decade ahead. Here you see red ink going on, on, on as far as the eyes can see. And if this makes tears run down your cheeks, they will match those that you see in red on this chart. This brings to mind you know, the mortal words of the late President Herbert Hoover, who said, Blessed are the young, for they shall inherit the national debt. <laughs> now, how have the Great Recession and today's sluggish economy treated private citizens? compared to federal employees. Well, take a look at who got stimulated. Here you have an amazing chart that came out uh, about October, November of last year. And you can see the private sector employment between January 2008, about the time the big slowdown took place, through July, middle of the last summer, down 6.8%. Local government pretty much tightened their belts and uh, employment went down 0.9%. State government about flat, 0.1%. Here you have federal government up 10%. So while the private sector is suffering, state and local governments are tightening their belts and keeping a pretty even keel. Here's Uncle Sam, up, up, and away, 10%, like Nero fiddling as Rome burns. USA Today took a look at how much money people make. And if you add salaries and wages together, what you find is the private sector, people are making in salaries and wages and benefits about 61,000. State and local government, about 69,000, almost 70. Federal government, $123,000 in salaries and benefits. People in Washington, D.C. who work for Uncle Sam are making double what people are in the private sector. 
So if you're anybody in Washington, D.C. whining and complaining about not getting by, they're being twice what we are. The people in Wisconsin and the state workers, and there's been an enormous amount of controversies, you know, they're not doing as well as the feds, but they certainly are doing about roughly 10% better than the private sector. So there's a perfect example of people in government who should be working for us, taking our money, putting their pockets, and doing a lot better than we are. Somewhat better than state and local government, and double where we are uh, in Washington, D.C., versus those of us in the private sector uh, on the ground across America. This has been going on for a while. You can see the gap back in the year 2000. There was a gap between civilian and government employment, and that gap only has grown uh, over the last uh, decade. Again, up, up, in a way. Here is uh, a, a look. I don't know if you can see this from where you're sitting very well, but this is basically the stimulus program, American Recovery and uh, Reinvestment Act, or the $814 billion stimulus, as, pre as President Obama <coughs> calls it. And if you take a look at these various programs, uh, you've got, for example, the overall budget, 70% of the stimulus budget is going to spend through September 2010, according to these figures. Uh, total ex expenditure, expenditure of $570 billion. They have claimed, <laughs> let's assume their numbers are correct, and they're not cooking the books, and everything they claim is accurate, 3.3 uh, million jobs uh, created or saved. That works out to $172,000 per job created or saved. $172,000 created or saved a, a job, according to Obama's stimulus and his numbers, if everything is correct. Now, some of this money is sent around to the various states and localities. You've got the LA Public Works Department in Los Angeles. They spend about $70.6 million to create or save 46 jobs at a cost of $1.5 million apiece. You have the LA Transportation Department. They spend $40.8 million to create or save nine jobs at a, quick, at a cost of $4.5 million apiece. And then some of these things are involved in green energy, you know, clean energy, and so on. You have US Geothermal with loan guarantees, Bright Source Energy. And you've got this company here, for example, $137 billion to create or save 86 jobs at a cost of $15.9 million apiece. And this company, $1.45 billion, 85 jobs created or saved at a cost of $17 million apiece. I promise if I gave each of you $17 million, you could create a job. <laughs> this is what we're doing, folks. This is the level of efficiency we're getting from this administration. Not a very efficient program at all. Now, all of this that I've described has torpedoed America's economic freedom. And the Heritage Foundation comes up with an annual index of economic freedom in conjunction with the Wall Street Journal. And they rank about 180 countries around the world in terms of their taxes, spending, regulations, legal culture, rule of law, et cetera. And then rank them according to how economically free they are. <coughs> and the United States, as you can see, from one through seven, uh, those are the countries ahead of us. We're number eight. Uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Switzerland, Canada, those are the top seven. The United States is number eight. We're now behind Canada. Canada is now more economically free than we are, so we're not vaccine behind Canada, believe it or not. You'll notice these are all bright green, and then these down here are light green. What this is, is these are considered the free market economies. The light green ones are the mostly free economies. The United States now is leading the mostly free category. We've dropped out of the free market uh, uh, economy category. We're now leading the mostly free pack. So we're number eight. We dropped below a score of 80, which is the definition of mostly free economy. Now we're at 78, which puts you in the mostly free rather than free category. Uh, we're now down here in the list of losers, the biggest <laughs> losers who dropped from 2009 to 2010. We're here with Equatorial Guinea, Venezuela, and Yemen. Uh, not up here with um, Montenegro and Rwanda and others that are making progress moving forward on the loser category. <laughs> <laughs> what went wrong between 2008 and 2009? Uh, again, government spending, a lot of government spending, that cost us points. Uh, monetary freedom, you've got the Federal Reserve just printing up money like crazy. It's like a giant Kinko's operation. That cost us a lot of points. Uh, financial freedom, you've got uh, the government taking over uh, uh, autom automotive companies, insurance companies, nationalizations. That cost us a lot of points. And then you have, interestingly enough, the issue of property rights. For those of you who have taken contract law, maybe you're taking it now, um, there are very serious contracts that said among General Motors and Chrysler, for example, that if they went bankrupt, that the uh, secured creditors would be paid first. The contract says, we lose money, whatever we get, you know, 25 cents of the dollar, you guys get paid before anybody else. Well, the Obama administration said, well, the hell with that. They took the contract, tore it in half, and said, we're going to pay off the United Auto Workers first. Those guys get paid before the secured creditors. The hell with the contract, the hell with the rule of law. Pay off those guys because they support us for the elections. They'll get their money. And you secured creditors, you get in line. If there's any money left after the UAW gets paid off, maybe you'll get a few, a few pennies on the dollar. But they get to jump, jump, jump the line ahead of you. 
that is a violation of property rights, and that is something that cost the United States a lot of books, which is why we went down in this, on this rating. Now, why is economic freedom important? Uh, if you take a look here at this um, uh, distribution of the free, mostly free, moderately free, mostly unfree, repressed economies, most of the free economies being Hong Kong, Switzerland, etc., repressed being Cuba, Venezuela, North Korea, etc. The more free you are, the more GDP per capita you have. The more money is available for people to enjoy what they want in life for themselves and their loved ones, and the more repressed you become, the less money you have in your pocket. We want to be going that way, not this way. If you care about the environment, you will find that, that uh, countries that are repressed have less income, and people there are worried about, you know, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? So they don't really have time to listen to World Wildlife Fund, what are we going to do about, uh, you know, um, Edison light bulbs versus uh, compact fluorescence. They're trying to figure out what's what's happening for dinner. Uh, here at the other end, you don't have to worry about so much whether you're going to eat tonight, so you can think about things like how do we clean up our environment. And so you want to be on this side of things, and as we move away from freedom and towards being most of the downward, it becomes more difficult to be environmentally conscious. And generally, when it comes to overall well-being, uh, this scatter plot shows that as you move from uh, economic repression to economic freedom, uh, the uh, UN's general um, uh, metrics of uh, overall well-being show that more prosperous countries do better and people are generally happier in that regard. So then, looking at all this, what can we do about this situation? Restoring America's economic liberty should be this country's first order of business. I think we need to end the overall tone of hostility that we've seen coming out of Washington over the last few years. Number two, I think we need to cut taxes and introduce tax incentives. Rather than a few small picayune uh, to use a phrase you know here in law school, narrowly tailored uh, tax reductions that Obama has proposed, America needs widespread, broad, permanent tax rate reduction. Uh, I also would advocate something I call the Tax Free Patent Act, which is if you come up with a brand new uh, device, I like to use the example of a wine glass where you pour in whatever wine you like, you drink it, you put the glass down and it replenishes it, whatever, whatever it is you just consume. Wouldn't that be a great invention? <laughs> you take that to the patent office, you get it patented, you can make as many of those as you want, hire as many people as you wish, manufacture them by the millions, export them overseas, and you don't have to pay any federal corporate tax for 10 years. You're 11, yeah, you've got to start paying. You have 10 years to knock yourselves out, turn yourselves to the next Thomas Edison, and make us proud of the next Steve Jobs, the case may be, thanks Mark Zuckerberg for that matter, and you've got 10 years and you don't have to worry about federal tax until you're 11. I think you've seen an, an enormous explosion in innovation, I think you've seen the unemployment rate plunging rapidly. I think this, if we've done this a couple years ago, I think this economy would be moving along much, much better. If people are concerned about the fact that the manufacturing base is weak in this country, I think we find that very satisfactory. Uh, I think we need to kill the death tax. We need to keep it at, uh, leave it at zero percent and kill it permanently. I think we need to eliminate the corporate tax. If we can't eliminate it, I think it needs to be cut at least to 24 percent, so we're playing on an even uh, playing field with the other OECD countries, which have cut their corporate taxes to 24 percent. We need to stop the massive federal spending and borrowing, which just continue to be going up, up, and away. All of this borrowing crowds out private capital. If you want to go borrow uh, from the bank, and you've got Uncle Sam there grabbing as much money from every place he can to pay off these bills, it makes it that much harder for you to borrow money as an entrepreneur or anybody else trying to get, get credit. Spending also creates huge distortions because this money almost always comes with strings attached. As Ronald Reagan also said, and I quote, if you crawl into bed with government, don't expect to get a good night's sleep. As I said earlier, this budget is growing at 8.6% while inflation is at 1 or 2%. So when it comes to spending our money, my simple advice to the Obama administration is this. Don't do something, just stand there. As for the rest of us, there is a lot of work for everyone when it comes to slowing, stopping, and reversing Barack Obama's socialist juggernaut. Those of you in the legal profession and in law school should pitch in and do your part. Those of us in journalism and the think tank movement should pitch in and do our part. Because if we don't, Pretty soon, none of us will have a part to pitch in. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, gosh, so much to talk about. <coughs> so uh, I am uh, here uh, serving my customary role as the Federalist Society's token liberal. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, actually had no idea what was going to be said today, so uh, I really can just uh, ask some questions about the character of the socialist juggernaut that's just been uh, described to you. Um, 
So just uh, questions about uh, specific things. Uh, so uh, Ken Feinberg, for example, who said that uh, salaries should be capped at $500,000. My question is, is he talking about all of the salaries in the United States or only those companies that are in receivership because they've been mismanaged that he uh, has authority over? I kind of want to go and check on that. Um, on the uh, health care bill, uh, you know, there are arguments to be had about whether the bill is a good idea or a bad idea, but it seems to me that uh, the way of calculating whether any individual provision is a good idea or a bad idea, you know, I mean, this is what you guys as lawyers are going to be paid for. If you're going to argue for or against the law, my advice is don't count the number of pages. That's probably not a good index of whether a law is a good law or a bad law. Uh, so, for example, uh, and, and then if you try to complicate, regulate something as complicated as the American healthcare industry, you know, we could argue about whether uh, it warrants regulation or not. As it happens, the United States is spending about twice as much per person for healthcare as uh, France or England or Canada uh, for about the same levels of morbidity and mortality. So this is uh, what really drove the uh, argument for regulation. And the argument for regulation in large part came from business because businesses were bearing the, I think, pretty exaggerated administrative costs of healthcare. Um, but you've got to figure out uh, what the regulations themselves are going to be complicated. Uh, just section 1111, which uh, he had up there, he said he found it truly baffling. Part of the baffling part, of course, was that it made reference to other uh, regulations that were not up there on the screen. It seemed to me, we, we, don't, we want to put it up again, that what it described was a mathematical formula. And I think that bureaucrats are capable of doing math. And uh, that if you run the mathematical formula, you'll get a determinate number. Uh, actual number that uh, you can calculate. That doesn't seem to me to be all that baffling. The organization chart was uh, you know, almost approached the complexity of a similar organization chart that I could devise for Northwestern Law School. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't mean that Northwestern Law School doesn't function. It just shows that with respect to any large administrative structure, you can construct a big, organ complicated organization chart. Uh, on uh, cap and trade, you know, one of the interesting things about the discussion of cap and trade was, and uh, I suppose this is uh, my more general concern with all of these complaints about government regulation, is that there was no discussion at all about the reasons for the regulation. Why did you have the regulation in the first place? The argument for cap and trade is a fairly familiar economic argument that markets don't capture externalities. If I engage in economic behavior and it imposes costs on people who aren't party to the contracts, then you're going to get too much of that behavior. And the idea of markets is that people are going to produce efficient levels of activity if they have to bear the full costs of their activity. And so cap and trade was fundamentally about that. Pollution regulation that is not centralized command and control, government telling polluters how much pollution they can produce, but the market determining, I mean, once you make people bear the costs of their activities, which activities are worthwhile or not. Cap and trade, actually, 15 years ago, when we had a very different Republican Party, was a Republican idea. Uh, the uh, issue of the deficits, the deficits are largely the consequence of the Bush tax cuts in uh, when uh, Bush II was elected. Uh, I'm, the, uh, I'm somewhat suspicious of the Heritage Foundation's Index of Economic Freedom. Uh, just a couple of the elements of that. One is government size, which implies that uh, the Americans lost economic freedom when we started the Iraq War. For that matter, the United States lost economic freedom when we got into any war at all. Presumably, Americans lost economic freedom when we put into place Social Security. Now, before Social Security, uh, we had something on the order of a third of 
people above 65 in desperate poverty. This didn't feel like economic freedom to them. So I just this seems to me to be a tendentious definition of freedom. Or financial freedom. Financial freedom is the ability of banks to operate without regulation. But you know, we actually tried that in the late years of the Bush administration, and it had, uh, I'll just note, distressing consequences. There might be reasons for regulating banks, and it's not clear that it's bad for the economy to regulate the behavior of banks. Uh, the definition of economic freedom is, uh, economic freedom correlates with uh, GDP per capita. Uh, GDP per capita, of course, pays no attention at all to distribution. And more and more wealth is concentrated at the top 1% of the American population. Uh, again, the question of whose economic freedom is at issue is something else that I'd just like to ask about. Uh, I was a little puzzled by the uh, concluding proposal for tax-free patents, which seems to go contrary to everything that was said before, since this seems to mean that while we've got a general tax on incomes, you, know, you uh, produce income, uh, you pay taxes on the income, now government is going to pick a particular sector of the economy that it thinks is particularly valuable and give it favorable tax treatment. And I just wonder, why would you think, you know, generally, if I produce a patent that uh, produces great economic value, one of the great virtues of a uh, free market economy is that I get to capture the additional wealth created by my patent. I don't need government to pick and choose which economic activities are productive, and in a free market, I get to capture the value of that. If you're after innovation, uh, one, I think, considerable obstacle to innovation, an obstacle to starting a small business, is if you have ever been sick in your life, seriously ill, and you're an adult, and you're working for a large corporation, and you've got that great idea that you want to start a small business to put forward, don't do it. You're going to lose your large corporate health insurance and have to buy health insurance on your own. So when you remove that burden from the economy, this is good for the economy. I mean, there's a general presumption that uh, is just bad for markets and bad for the development of human capital to have government intervention. I'll just end by saying uh, something about the sainted Ronald Reagan, who appeared a couple of times in uh, the uh, discussion. Uh, you know, now, you know, I'm deploying human capital here. You know, I'm a professor at Northwestern Law School. I was in school forever. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, this is not such an easy job to get. I actually had the extraordinary good fortune to graduate from college in 1979, just before student aid for people whose parents weren't able to contribute a penny to college education, of whom my parents were an example, uh, was massively cut under Reagan. It would have cost me far more in student loans to go to the University of Chicago where I went uh, if I had graduated a bit later. This is bad for the development of human capital, having there be less opportunity on the basis of merit in the United States because big government has been cut. Uh, is, uh, I, I don't think that this is good for advancing societal wealth. So the idea that any time government does anything that is uh, in advance of a socialist juggernaut seems to me to be a fairly massive oversimplification. Thank you very much. Let me respond just to a couple of those points and then we'll open this up to questions. Um, on the issue of Ken Feinberg and these, um, uh, what he saw as a cap on what people should earn, my, my belief was this interview was something I saw about 14, 15 months ago. Uh, he was talking about uh, where he thought corporations should corporations ought to be in general. That was my sense. And you know, go back and check the manuscript. That's about how I remember it. Um, on the issue of Obamacare and the number of pages, whether you can determine whether a law is good law or bad law, depending on the number of pages in the, uh, in the uh, U.S. Code, uh, I do think it is relevant because when you have 2,801 pages, for starters, almost always you're going to have additional pages of regulations put out by the Department of Health and Human Services, the U.S. Treasury Department, whichever agencies get involved in this, the FDA, what have you. A um, perfect example of this is um, a certain area 
that covers something called, uh, let's see, ACOs, Accountable Care Organizations. And these are a little bit like HMOs, but rather than being run by insurance companies, they're run by doctors and hospitals. So Obamacare creates this thing called ACOs. The part of the uh, legislation that covers this is just six pages. It's not so bad, just six pages. The Department of Health and Human Services just last week came out with the regulations to explain, and delineate, and, and get into further detail on these six pages. That particular document is 429 pages long. So we've got just six pages of legislation and 429 pages of very, very, again, dense, baffling legalese. And you guys will pay a lot of money to get through all this dense, baffling legalese, which is good for you, but I don't think it's good for the economy overall. So I do think the length of a, of a law is something quite relevant. Um, in terms of the administrative cost of health care to business, and some businesses are clamoring for something like Obamacare, um, I think the best way to handle the whole issue of health care is to get it out of the hands of employers. Look, when you guys get car insurance, or you get homeowner's insurance, you get apartment insurance, nobody says, who's your employer? When you buy a plane ticket to fly from Chicago to LA or Miami, nobody says, well, what's your group? They say, do you want to fly first class or business, and when do you want to leave, or coach, whatever it may be? This whole idea that healthcare has to be tied to your employer is something that goes back to World War II. This is a World War, a temporary World War II fighting measure. And the issue was that employers were not allowed to give pay increases uh, during World War II, and FDR's concern was if we get pay increases going up, Inflation. You didn't want the inflation during World War II while we're fighting the Nazis in Imperial Japan through Mussolini. And so the thought was you may not increase wages. What companies did, however, was they were able to increase their benefits. So if, for example, Northwestern wanted to keep Professor a compliment on, on the faculty, they'd say, look, we can't give you a pay raise, but we'll give you, we'll pay, take care of your health insurance. So all of a sudden he says, hey, that's great, I think I'll stick around. Well, this temporary measure that we used to fight Adolf Hitler is still something we're, we're fighting today. We're still trying to get out of this mess from the 1940s. So I think the entire connection between employees and employers and having your boss pay for your health insurance, your boss should give you your pay, and you want to go out and buy the health plan that you like, according to your specifications, your health needs, whatever you, your loved ones, your family, whatever it is, uh, you want to have on your plan, and you go out and buy something you like. Why should it be up to your boss? And this also leads to something that Professor Koppelman alluded to, which is the issue of job lock. And this is a very sad situation where people will have a job, hate the job, hate their boss, hate their coworkers. They can't stand to go to work in the morning, but they go there because they know if they lose their jobs, they're going to lose insurance. And then nobody will be there to take care of their insulin or take care of whatever particular pills or creams or, or liquids or injections, whatever it is that they need to, to get better or take care of their, their loved ones who are expecting them to be covered. I think what we should have is a totally different paradigm where you have, you buy your own healthcare plan, you own it just like you own your bank account, just like you own your stock portfolio, just like you own your homeowner's deed, and you take that from job to job to job. And if you don't like your job, you can just say to your boss, look, I'm out of here. And out you go, and you take your health insurance, you go someplace where you're happy. That entire model of having your employer be the person that gives you your healthcare, I think needs to be dismantled. Um, on cap and trade, yes, it is important to capture uh, externalities. This is something that, that ought to be done, I agree with you. I do think that this does have a very heavy-handed governmental approach when the government sets what the total cap is, and then the government decides what it ought to be and pushes it down. And then a lot of this is a lot of the cap and trade measure is not so much individual corporations uh, and polluters trading credits among themselves. A lot of it involves extra taxes and money going uh, to Washington D.C. rather than among the companies. So I think it's a flawed model. I do think it can be done differently and maybe better, but not the way that it's been proposed. In terms of the deficits. People like to say, well, the reason we have deficits are because of the Bush tax cuts. The reason that we have high deficits in this country is because we are spending a lot of money. We're spending an enormous amount of money, spend a lot of money under Bush, a whole lot of money under Obama, trillions and trillions of dollars of spending. <coughs> Again, I blame Bush for this. I blame Bush, I blame Karl Rove for the idea that, well, if we just behave like Democrats and spend a lot of money, as Karl Rove said, we'll have a permanent conservative governing majority. It turned out to be not permanent, not very co uh, conservative, and until the Republicans got back in last November, uh, they weren't governing because they were not the majority. So the ditch into which the GOP and the right drove in 2008 was the direct result of listening to Karl Rove's hideous, awful, reprehensible advice. I don't know why that man's on Fox every time I turn it on. I wish he'd shut up and go away. He has nothing to offer this republic based on the damage that he did, the damage is Boston by spending us into a hole. And unfortunately, rather than fill the hole, Barack Obama got a couple holes and just started shoveling. And down and down we go. Way too much spending leading to deficits. Uh, Medicare drug plan would be an example of this. No child left behind, approximately doubling of U.S. education department spending. Uh, several transportation bills, several agricultural bailout bills. There were actually, to his credit, there were several uh, uh, agricultural uh, subsidy programs that Bill Clinton killed as part of being a new Democrat. 
And guess what? George W. Bush brought them back to life. He actually resurrected agricultural programs that Bill Clinton killed. So he was not a limited government uh, type. He was a big government conservative. Uh, compassionate conservative means basically, you know, you wear a Brooks Brothers suit, you behave like LBJ. That's what he did, and that's part of the reason we're in the situation we are today. Uh, on the Tax-Free Patent Act, yes, I'll admit that it is a bit, I guess, of, of industrial policy, maybe somewhat more free market industrial policy, you could say that. Uh, my concern is that I don't think our country is anywhere as innovative as we should be. I want to see more Edisons, I want to see more Steve Jobs, I want to see more people coming up, coming up with interesting products and goods and services that we can deliver. And I think that uh, a real shot in the arm would be, again, if you can produce this, and yeah, you would pay income tax on it, but if you pay no corporate tax, I think you have an enormous benefit see all kinds of products and services being produced, jobs being created, wealth being created, distributed, and shared, and I think overall it would be a very good thing for our economy. It would be a different approach than I think we've ever taken before. Uh, who knows, it might fail, but I think it might work. Maybe it's worth a try. Uh, and finally, on the um, issue of healthcare and entrepreneurship, just to reiterate, yes, it is important if you're an entrepreneur and you want to start your own company, uh, that you not have to worry about health insurance and, and that whole issue. And again, I think the way to do it is to create a market for individual healthcare policies that you own, they don't belong to your boss, you take them with you, and if you decide you had it with your company, you want to go out and compete with them, then great. Off you go, you can take your own healthcare policy home with you, and then, like Jerry Maguire in that great movie, you go and compete against your boss, starting your own company, put them out of business. So those are my answers to Professor Kaufman's comments. I guess we've got about 15, 20 minutes for questions. Yes? Okay. Um, you can direct me and Professor, if you want to get up here, we can share the mic if you want. Uh, I don't need a mic. You don't need a mic? Or you, there's a mic over there if you want to use dueling platforms. Like <laughs> they know me. I don't need a mic. Can anyone hear me? <laughs> so why don't we uh, ask you, stand up, tell us who you are, and ask a question. We'll uh, do our best to answer. If we have, sir, here. Yeah, uh, Tim Fry. I'm a 1L here at Northwestern. Hi, Tim. Um, I want to go back to one of the charts you put up, which was the chart of the federal government's growth vis-a-vis -vis household income. And, and something I, I guess I had questions throughout your whole presentation on all the statistics is, but my assumption is the household income chart is about income. It doesn't include the massive increases of employers' health insurance. Yes, that one right there. And, and so I guess I would have a problem, I think this chart's it, if indeed that's the case, which I believe it is, that it's just income and doesn't include health insurance, is the big increase in the federal government since the 1970s, the late 60s, is the Medicare and Medicaid budgets. That's well, that the, more. well it, in wars, but Medicare and Medicaid uh, is the thing that went from zero to uh, astronomical. It's the thing moving forward that bankrupts our budget. If, it, if median household income on this chart doesn't include health insurance, this is not comparing anything approaching fair uh, value in terms of what the government has had to add. Now you could say, well, the government's gone crazy, but the only answer to that then is Medicare and Medicaid being cut completely. And I don't think, in fact, I would say Republicans, uh, conservatives have gone the opposite way. I haven't heard anybody say Medicare needs to go away, and that's our expense of the federal government beyond the pale, beyond anything else. So. I, I, this is the chart I think best represented it to me, but I just have questions of the statistics throughout. Good. And uh, I don't know if you have a response, I'm sure you do, but that's my concern with much of the evidence presented. Thank you. Uh, to be honest, I don't know, if, I assume this is income, I don't know if it includes <coughs> benefits, it may not. My guess is if you put <coughs> benefits in, the line might be up here somewhere. It's not going up 242%. I think you probably could say that with some confidence. Uh, this does include uh, Medicare and Medicaid spending, but also includes, again, agriculture subsidies. Uh, all the other things that the federal government does. We total federal spending, including defense. I mean, it's basically been up, up, and away. Um, on Medicare, you don't see Republicans saying we should end Medicare. I think a lot of people are saying that we need to, to adjust this. I don't think the Republicans, to my taste, are doing enough to talk about reforming entitlements, although I think tomorrow Congressman Paul Ryan of Wisconsin is going to unveil a new budget that cuts $4 trillion in spending over 10 years. Uh, I think one simple thing we ought to do on, on Medicare and Social Security is Right now, uh, when you turn 67, you become eligible for benefits. People are living to be 80 and 90 years old. If you're getting benefits now, you should get them. If you're 55 or above, you should, should be touched. But if you're like me, born in the 1960s, I think I'm eligible at age 67. I would be able to wait till age 60 or 69. People born in, born in the 70s who might be eligible, right, they'd also be 67. Maybe they should wait till 69 or 70. I mean, per decade, you can push it out one year, and you're not going to throw granny outside. Grandpa won't have to eat cat food and all this other, all these ridiculous cliches. And I think if you push that curve out a little bit and give people lots of time to adjust as their uh, 
uh, life expectancies go up in the 80s, 90s, and probably even 100, uh, they will be able to work a little bit longer and the situation, the, the uh, program will be, will be stable. As it is right now, Medicaid, I think since 2007, is spending more money going out than money coming in. Uh, Social Security was supposed to start doing that in 2017, greater outflow than inflow. The uh, greater inf uh, outflow than inflow began not 2017, but 2000, I believe 2010, I think last year, seven years ahead of, of the expectation. So these programs are hemorrhaging very bad. If we don't do, don't do something about them, they're really going to hemorrhage all of us. Uh, just one thought about the size of government. Uh, the premise of uh, what you both said is that uh, you know, making sure that uh, old people are not impoverished and that they do get adequate medical care. As soon as you say that that's a responsibility of government, and then you know how to do it, I think you know there's reasonable argument about how you do it. How you do it is going to be a complicated problem. But as soon as you say that it's a concern of government, it is automatically going to follow that government's going to get bigger. And the enlarging of government is not an impediment to your freedom. All of this increase in spending, what comes with that spending is that if I need medical care when I'm old, the government's going to provide it. That's an augmentation of my wealth right now. Other questions? Uh, let's go over here. This oh, hi, I'm, I'm Dave. I'm one out. Hi, Dave. Um, so spending is comprised both of actual dollars coming out and also tax expenditures. Do you think the federal government should minimize those as well, tax expenditures such as uh, giving homeowners an interest deduction on their mortgages or the so-called <coughs> carrying interest loophole for private equity and hedge fund managers that allows them to take their, what is essentially income, to have a tax at a 15% rate instead of the uh, my general view on uh, taxes is that I favor a voluntary flat tax of about probably roughly 15%. And my view is that you ought to be able to determine whether you want to have all those, the write-offs, the deductions, the loopholes, and the 67,000 page tax code. If you like that, keep it one wonderful, fill out the taxes that way. If instead you'd rather have a 15% or 17 or so percent flat tax, fill out the postcard, avoid all the headaches and paperwork, and send it in. You do that. It's your money. It's your choice. And let, let Americans choose one or the other. That's how I would handle it. That avoids the whole political wrestling match that would erupt. Oh, you want to take away the mortgage reduction? Do you want to take away the charitable deduction? Don't take anything away. Let people choose. And some people would like to keep that. Other people would rather have a flat tax. And I think um, find uh, a more, um, uh, more efficient economy and also a greater human happiness so people have a choice uh, in, in what sort of tax regime they follow. I will simply say, just as a matter of ultimate value judgment, I think that it's fair for me to pay a larger proportion of my income than the person who's going to be cleaning up this room this evening pays as a percentage of their income. Sir, I think Kaufman had a point. Please stand up and tell us who you are. Yeah, uh, my name is Vincent Friel. I think uh, Professor Kaufman made a point during his uh, rebuttal uh, about the value that other countries get. Other countries have more government regulation of health care, more government provision of health care. They seem to get better dollars better dollar value for it. They seem to have so spent much less like per person than we do on health care. They still have relatively comparable mortality rates and general well being rates. And, and so I mean why doesn't that see why why would you say that they, they get away with that and why can't we do that? I think that's for you. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, uh, as a matter of fact I have some figures on this um, in terms of Great Britain. Uh, and in Great Britain they definitely have the National Health Service, which is big uh, you know, they have the public option there big time. Uh, if you happen to fall victim of breast cancer in the United States, the fatality rate for women with breast cancer is about 25%. Uh, in Great Britain, the fatality rate is 46%, almost double. Uh, so yeah, you get free medicine, which is great, but if you have breast cancer, you're twice as likely approximately to drop dead from breast cancer over there than here. In this country, if you're a man with prostate cancer, uh, prostate cancer proves fatal to 19% of American men who endure it. In Canada, which has single payer, that number is 25%. And in Great Britain, fully 57% of men who get prostate cancer succumb to it, triple the rate in the United States. I'd much rather take our system here. Uh, the only thing that I'll say here is it's not clear to me that this is a function of uh, the source of the care rather than the culture of uh, the medical profession. American doctors are much more aggressive about treating cancer than European doctors. I'm not sure if that's uh, a consequence of where the money's coming from. Overall, morbidity and mortality. Other questions, sir. You made a proposal earlier that you thought. What's your name? I'm oh, sorry, my name is Nick Gamzi. I'm a partner here. Uh, you made a proposal earlier and talked about the tax.
tax rates in this country. And you stated that you thought that we were losing large multinational corporations in part because of these imposing taxes that we have. But I think recent news, for example, with GE has shown that act, in actuality, these corporations are quite good at minimizing their tax exposure. Um, for those of you who don't know, General Electric didn't pay any taxes to the federal government this year. Um, They're getting $5 billion or something. Yeah, they got a, actually a large credit back. They had very good tax lawyers. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so I, I'm curious to know where, where you think that balance is. It seems as though perhaps that suggests that there should be a flat tax with fewer loopholes, less opportunity for uh, bureaucrats to push uh, tax benefits to their constituent corporations. But with your own proposal that you just mentioned of letting corporations choose which one they want, it seems that all that's going to do is uh, push down the tax revenues that the United States government is getting, which of course is going to perpetuate and exacerbate the uh, problem we have with the deficit. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I do think that one way to handle this is to have uh, something closer to a corporate flat tax, I suppose. And I guess if people choose, they might choose whichever one is more the, the income maximizing one, I suppose, a tax uh, reducing one, I, I imagine. But I do think that would be a much more efficient situation. I heard once that General Motors, I think it was GM or GE, I think it was GM actually, that their tax return was like 13,000 pages. I mean, just, you know, like the tax return this big. And then they've got people who uh, sit there all day and all night, all, three, three, 365 days a year working just on the taxes. Um, I know somebody whose uh, dad works, I believe, at GM. And there are several IRS agents who are in the building all the time as almost like full employees. And they have these IRS bureaucrats there who sit there and they'll say, okay, well, Joe, what, what does the tax code say about this? And these people are on site to make sure G, or GM rather, uh, has you know, kind of direct oversight from the IRS. Uh, that's a very, very uh, complicated, bizarre situation. And I think uh, having fewer loopholes and uh, at least the option for fewer loopholes and more straightforward tax rate, I think would lead to a, a more efficient situation, probably less likely to have someone like GE, a company like GE pay have zero tax. We've got people waiting. Okay. okay, all right. We've got time for how many more questions? Um, two. Two more questions. Okay, two more. The penultimate question, sir. Uh, my name is Juan Gutierrez, and I'm a 3L. I was wondering if you could respond to uh, Professor Koppelman's allusion to uh, compassion, morality. Uh, Professor Koppelman just said that he would rather uh, contribute a portion of his salary to a worker that comes in to clean this facility. He doesn't feel like he should be uh, paid as a greater percentage. Are you in compassion? Do you not care for the uh, for those that make make uh, a lesser income? Is this completely, you know, greed? Fill my pockets. I'm a big corporate monster. Be me. Gotcha. Great question. No, I mean when it comes to the question of morality, I think it's appropriate for people to be compassionate. I'm not sure that what is, was compassion for the poor, those people who are not as fortunate as we are in this room in terms of what we've achieved or what we're going to achieve in the future that the way to handle that compassion is to give the money to the IRS. <laughs> you can give money to private charity, you can give money to a charter school, uh, you could set up some sort of program to help people of lower income, to feed them, to clothe them, to entertain them, to give them uh, something we have in New York called Outward Bound, um, where we take kids who are living in Harlem, Spanish Harlem, uh, I'm sorry, it's not, oh, oh, yeah, that's right, it's called Fresh Air Fund, give them Fresh Air Fund, and they get to go to summer camp. Uh, there's a man by the name of, of Dan Rose who is in Harlem. I'm sorry, he's a, uh, a realtor, and he started something called the Harlem Educational Activities Fund. Uh, he takes kids who are in Harlem, low income, food stamps, many of them don't have dads. Uh, they give them all kinds of training and mentorships. So they can take SATs and go on to college. These are kids who are living in the streets and, and have every excuse to fail. And thanks to his support and his resources, they go on to Yale, they go on to Princeton. I think some of them come to Northwestern. Some of them are now practicing as lawyers. Some of them doctors, one of them is a, a surgeon at, at Yale Hospital, I believe, uh, and this is all private money. This is out of the compassion of, uh, of Dan Rose, who literally owns skyscrapers in Manhattan. There are skyscrapers that go up 67 feet with his name out front, and he can be greedy and pocket the money. What he does is not just give it to the IRS, he certainly pays his taxes, but he started an excellent private charity that has taken uh, poor black and poor Hispanic kids and given them, given them the opportunity to learn to excel and to do very well for themselves. And I think that's a great way to, to express one's compassion, rather than just say that the compassion will be expressed by my giving my money to the IRS, hoping that people in Washington somehow express the compassion that we could express on our own as individuals. I just to add, uh, I don't think that I use the word compassion, 
Uh, you know, the problem with using the word compassion is that it treats social welfare as a sort of moral gymnasium for those of us who have money to uh, exercise our compassion muscles. I think that uh, people who are members of the society are entitled, have a right, not dependent on anybody else's good graces, to have their needs taken care of. And uh, you know, we, you know, what would it be like to have a society in which you relied entirely on private compassion to provide the medical needs of people who are poor and don't have health insurance? Well, we just tried that experiment. In fact, we've been trying it for decades. And you see people dying of diseases that are preventable and treatable. Uh, now that we do so well in uh, treating cancer, uh, which is detected early, it makes a huge difference to people. I think they're entitled to the treatment. And it's quite clear that the private sector wasn't I love the, the expression moral gymnasium. I've got, I've got to incorporate that into my uh, lexicon. It's, it's from uh, George Bernard Shaw. Uh, <coughs> it's a man and Superman, one of the characters. Man and Superman, and moral gymnasium. I would just add one thing that, uh, on the issue of compassion. Uh, if the government is going to be involved in something, I think it needs to be focused, and it just needs to focus on people who are low income, and the best way to take care of them is through direct uh, cash subsidies, as opposed to having a big bureaucracy sit there and sort of govern and supervise. Uh, we also have the problem in this country of providing compassion to people on Park Avenue. There's an excellent website uh, called the Environmental Working Group, EWG, Environmental Working Group, and they actually have um, a wonderful interactive map you can put in any zip code, and they will show you which people are getting agricultural subsidies. And it's great fun to put in, uh, like 10022, which is where Donald Trump lives, for example, and you'll see people on Park Avenue and Fifth Avenue, you can look this up online, who are getting agricultural subsidies because daddy or grandpa or great grandpa bought a farm in Iowa or Nebraska and their money's still coming in even though they never have set foot on the soil. They're not out there tilling and breaking their backs in the sunshine. They're living in Park Avenue and you know, having tea at the Plaza Hotel and so forth, probably working out at the non-moral gymnasium. And <laughs> in comes the money. And just as an exercise, I put in uh, 90210, Beverly Hills. And up pop all these little dots in Beverly Hills of people who are getting ag subsidies including, does the name Jack Benny mean anything to anybody in this room other than <laughs> Professor and me? Yeah. One or two. Okay, Jack Benny was a very, very funny comedian back in the 30s, 40s, I guess 30s through the 70s, and passed away in 1974 or so. Uh, there are agricultural subsidies going to the estate of Jack Benny. Jack Benny's grandkids are getting money because their dad was a great, very funny comedian, probably bought a farm as an investment back in the 40s or 50s. He's been dead since 1974, probably before many of you were alive, and his grandkids are getting ag subsidies that you're paying for. Now, there's one thing to say, let's be compassionate give food stamps to poor people. It's quite another for us to be giving money to the grandchildren of a dead comedian who's a very funny man in Beverly Hills. I think that's an utter absurdity and that kind of thing needs to be stamped out. We have time for one more question. I think we'll uh, wrap it up and let you get on with your legal education. Sir, right here is the last question. Yeah, Steve. Uh, too well. Hi, um, Steve. So, I realize the scope of the, the talk is much broader than, than simply health care, but uh, I, I guess my question was, I, I know you Are you suggesting any alternative to the Obama plan, or are you suggesting that there isn't a problem now? Because it, it, it seems to me that uh, if, in fact, the alternative is to let individuals pay for it, I've tried paying for insurance as an individual before, it's just prohibitively expensive. Uh, so what, what is the, the suggestion on how we should proceed to fix it if indeed it needs to be fixed? Good. Uh, that's a good question, which, which will require a long answer. We'll try to make, give you offer you a short one. Uh, yes, I do think the situation is a mess right now. My personal insurance is going 34% this month, so I personally feel this. And I was told Obamacare would bring costs down. My costs are going 34%. Uh, basically, what needs to change is the whole paradigm that says, if you want insurance, you've got to go talk to your boss. If you want insurance, you ought to be able to buy it in an individual market, which needs to be developed, which doesn't really exist in any big way. You ought to be able to buy insurance across state lines. If you find an insurance company in Florida that provides whatever kind of care you want, you ought to be able to buy it from there, from there without having to beg the insurance commissioner in Springfield to give you permission to buy it from someone in Florida. If you want a home loan or car insurance or any of this or credit card, you can get that outside of Illinois. Why are you only allowed to buy what the insurance commissioner of Illinois says you can? That's number one. Number two, uh, you ought to be able to own and control this policy, take it with you wherever you want in your life. You shouldn't have to rely on your boss or Northwestern as a student to provide it for you. And number three, if you're too poor to pay for it yourself, the, the government's involvement should be in what I would call health stamps. Just like we have food stamps, we'll provide health stamps. So here, you're poor, we're gonna give you 
2,500, 3,000, whatever the number is. Tom Coburn suggests, I think, 2,500 tax credit for individuals and 5,700 for families. We can debate about the number. But you get the money and you go buy something you like. We're not going to sit here and dictate and come up with an elaborate scheme of what ought to be in that plan. You go buy the plan you like. When we decided in the 60s that we didn't want to have people starving this country, we could have come up with a plan to nationalize the uh, supermarkets and have the, the, the carrot uh, control department and the National Bureau for Broccoli Standards and somebody else come up with how many calories a day we should have and what's the proper menu and blah. No, we came up with food stamps. We said, look, you're poor. We don't want you to starve. Have some food stamps. Go eat dinner. Put some meat on your bones. No, you can't use it for alcohol, but yeah, you can go by yourself if you want to have, have a hamburger, great. If you want to have tacos, terrific. If you want to do uh, you know, uh, an omelet, whatever you want to do, you decide. We'll just take care of your at the expense. That's what the government's involvement should be for poor people in healthcare. We provide what's called premium support to help you buy your plan, and you go buy the plan you want. That bill could be written in probably five or 10 pages, not 2,801 pages of dense, baffling legalese, only be to, to be understood by bright young people like you. Of course, if the uh, health insurance company gets to scrutinize one applicant at a time, which is what happened to you, then uh, the rates tend to be high if people have any bad health history. There's, uh, I mean, there are clearly downsides to employer-provided health care, but one of the advantages is, one of the idea of insurance is pooling risk. When insurers write insurance for large blocks of people, the way that they do for large employers, then you get pooling of risk. If everybody buys their own health care policy, then you don't get that. And if you have sales across state lines, so that if the company that has the laxest regulation gets to market all across the country, then you get a race to the bottom where everybody gets lousy health insurance unless they're very sophisticated consumers of health care. Uh, I will say that we are united in our hatred of agricultural <laughs> subsidies <laughs> and eagerly look forward to the moment when Paul Ryan decides that he's going to follow in Bill Clinton's footsteps and say we're going to get rid of agricultural subsidies. I wonder why he hasn't. You've been a great audience. Thank you very much.